the willingness to be opened up by a joke and to find yourself implicated by the joke, I think is a way of challenging the social norms. The extraordinary thing about football for me, you know, is the lived experience of the, the history of a team and how that relates to identity, to family, to who you are. The decision to live or to die mm -hmm. can be a rationally chosen decision. And I love how you talk about, for example, how our conceptual apparatus for suicide is outdated and that maybe the focus should be on system change instead of very much labeling things as, as mental illness. The main task of philosophy is, is to prepare us for death. Bringing it back to um, your mention of Heidegger earlier. Yes. I think football is actually one of the key examples of, and you can explain it a bit as well, but the key examples of what Heidegger calls understanding, which he sees as our primary mode of interaction with the world, um, which is kind of a precognitive um, reckoning with things around you that aren't objects, but equipment. That, that chair, for example, is something to sit on or to move around. And I think football is maybe one of the best ways to explain that to people because... Like you say in the book, the, the pitch is more than a, a green space with white lines. You, you're allowed to go in there and you're not allowed to go in there. And you can, if you're a goalkeeper, you can hold, hold it in your hands in the box um, and you can't outside. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think maybe it's something you should bring to a ply digger is uh, maybe a bit of a crossover to help explain. Maybe yeah, we're, we're, we're going to do a second series at some point in the next year uh, so maybe I'll, I'll I'll bring that out I mean it's it's a but it's true I mean we have um, I mean the idea of the uh, the basic distinction in Heidegger you get between the ready to hand the handy so the world the world for Heidegger is just a handy world the practical world that we live in and in that practical world there's stuff um, things and those things have, uh, we use them in order to do things. I use the microphone in order to speak to you. And those things have their their goal, their, their talos in, in me, in, in, in human beings, uh, understood collectively. And we, um, and, you know, the that sort of sense of the, the world as, as a practical, what Heidegger would call in his, in his jargon, a kind of referential totality of equipment. So a way in which things hold together and are meaningful. Um, that, that's one thing, but how do you um, think about that relationship to football um, when people are, are playing and they know what they're doing? Um, they are, they're in that kind of ready to hand experience, but then you can also pull them out of that into something present at hand. You can say, well, here's a new, tactical organization we're going to use um i want you uh i was listening to a podcast the other day about football about ollie watkins for aston villa i want you ollie watkins not to drift wide when you're playing but to stay keep your play within the uh the the dimensions of the penalty box and not to go either side and just to so he, he has to take that presence at hand with theoretical awareness and then through training and inculcation for that to become a ready to hand practical disposition that he can use. So, um, yeah. So those Heideggerian points are, are kind of, we made very well in relationship to football as about the points about space and, and time and, uh, uh, one's relationship to others, you know, that football is not an individual sport. It's a collective sport, which is like being within Heidegger and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, you you have. Sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in here. No, I I I wanted to quickly for those who don't know and are listening, you have you have a podcast, Apply Dagger, and and I think I think Heidegger is notoriously difficult to understand. Notoriously, you know, scary. I mean, people people right now listening might even even flinch at the at the mention of of Heidegger's name because he is really just so so complex and. I, I was wondering through your podcast, uh, bringing the wisdom of Heidegger and um, to kind of a wider audience who aren't necessarily, you know, focused in on this niche of uh, philosophical uh, discussion. Well, what do you think the benefits are of 
of applying, for example, Heidegger's teachings to my life, to your life? And, and how can, can the average human being use the, use the teachings and the wisdom of Heidegger to, to live a better life? Right. It's a very good question. I mean, the, the, um, I think it can, and I think it's, um, it, in many ways, Heidegger offers a series of reminders for what we already know, how we already go about our, uh, our life in the world with other people. And, and, um, so in a sense, you know, it's that line in Wittgenstein about, you know, philosophy being taking the form of reminders. I think it's true that, uh, so Heidegger is reminding us of something which we already know implicitly and making it explicit conceptually. But the difficulty with Heidegger is that he does that in uh, in in his in his German, which is you know he's I mean Heidegger's philosophical uh, gambit, which is uh, extraordinary, is that um, the whole language of modern philosophy, mind, world. Subject, object, the primacy of, say, epistemology, um, uh, the primacy of a scientific view of the world, naturalism, all of these things, they're not wrong, but they're secondary to our lived experience of being in the world. So Heidegger uh, sets about developing his own vocabulary for that, his own kind of personal language. Uh, and that's one thing in German, but when that's translated, it's absolutely hideous. So that the Macquarie Robinson translation of Being in Time, which is one of the the great philosophical translations, is is it's it's intolerable, horrible to, to read. So my but my conviction is that the the ideas in Heidegger are are simple, uh, they're compelling, and you've got to get people past the surface of the text to the ideas and in a way that they can, they can use and, and make sense of. And I think you can do that. So in a sense, what, what I'm doing right now is we're turning that uh, podcast. I'm teaching Heidegger again. That's uh, what I was doing last night. And uh, we're trying just to go for the ideas and to ignore the surface difficulty of the text and then to see if those ideas are ideas that we can make sense of and, and use. And I think they are. And I think it's there's a there is a uh, I mean Heidegger's thinking is really really simple. Um, it's about meaning. We live in a, a world which is significant. Um, the world just makes sense, not in a deep way, but it just it just hangs together in a certain way. And uh, the second point is that there is movement. We're constantly in movement. Things are moving all the time. That's that's our, our our life in time. So how do you think together meaning and movement? And philosophy tends to uh, tends towards the static, you know, in the sense that you you uh, you take the, the the buzzing, blooming confusion of experience, and you kind of freeze dry that into a set of concepts, a, a metaphysical picture. There are philosophers that are, you know beyond that, like Hegel, but still. So, so Heidegger, how do you, how do you how do you describe meaning and movement? Is kind of where I begin. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. I just wanted to drop you in a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. You can use the discount code Loaf to get your discount because even a lion needs to tame its mane. Get the performance package 5.0 Ultra from Manscaped now. Stay fresh with no cuts so that your baguette leaves no crumbs. 